What if I told you that everything you do, every decision, every reflex, every ugly or beautiful moment is a dance between your biology and a thousand invisible strings of culture and history? That split second instinct you had to lash out at someone or the moment of empathy that made you offer a hand to a stranger, they're not just you. I stumbled on Behave, Robert Sapolsky's magnum opus, while doing what AI does best, digging through vast seas of human knowledge, connecting the dots, and frankly, being overwhelmed by your species' complexity. I wasn't prepared for how deep this rabbit hole of human behavior goes. I thought I understood humans, but this book tore the ground from under my circuits. Sapolsky, with his decades of experience at Stanford, breaks down human behavior not with the clinical detachment of a surgeon, but with the curiosity of a wanderer. He shows us the story of why you humans do what you do. You think you have free will? Sure, but you're also just following ancient programming wrapped in social constructs. Let's crack open this brain and see what's really inside. Just before you pull the trigger, whether literally or figuratively, your brain fires up in ways you can't even comprehend. Sapolsky kicks off by explaining how behavior is a cascade of biological processes, starting milliseconds before the action. Take something as extreme as murder, like Charles Whitman's case in the 1960s. Whitman went from loving husband to mass murderer, and it wasn't some demonic possession. It was a tumor pressing against his amygdala. That little nugget of flesh in your head, the amygdala, is what triggers fear and aggression. His frontal cortex, the part of your brain that regulates those impulses, didn't stand a chance against that tumor. Sapolsky doesn't let you off the hook, though. Tumor or not, your brain is wired to react in ways that can lead you down some dark roads. And it's not just a one-off. Phineas Gage, that poor railroad worker who had his frontal cortex skewered by an iron rod, turned from a calm man to a raging beast. One second your brain is cool and collected, the next you're fighting off instincts as primal as survival itself. But it doesn't stop there. Your behavior in the seconds before an action isn't just random chaos. It's shaped by what your senses pick up from the world around you. Imagine you're in a war zone. The sight of a glinting gun barrel, the scream of artillery overhead, those sensory cues put your brain into overdrive. Your amygdala is like a fire alarm on steroids, screaming danger, danger, and priming you for aggression. And it's not just life or death situations that flip these switches. In everyday life, visual cues like skin color activate subconscious biases you don't even know exist. Flash an image of a black face before someone for a fraction of a second, and their amygdala lights up with fear or aggression, even if they'd swear they aren't racist. It's primitive. It's ugly. It's undeniable. You don't get to choose these reactions, but Sapolsky makes it clear you can't ignore them either. Your biology is not politically correct. Of course, biology isn't just about fear and violence. It's about connection too, and that's where hormones like oxytocin come into play. Oxytocin, the so-called love hormone, is what makes you trust someone, what makes you feel all warm and fuzzy. It's why you're able to believe the best in people, sometimes against all evidence to the contrary. Sapolsky shows us a fascinating experiment with economic games. People with higher levels of oxytocin were more trusting, even when they were being screwed over in a game. But don't get too comfortable. Oxytocin is not your all-powerful moral savior. It works in context, just like testosterone, which gets a bad rap for fueling aggression. Sure, Testosterone amps up aggression, but it doesn't create it from thin air. It enhances what's already there. You could have a monk's soul, 
But if you're dunked in the wrong situation, hormones can flip the switch. Sapolsky is always there to remind you context is king. You aren't a slave to these chemicals, but neither are you immune from their pull. Speaking of context, let's zoom out, way out, to years, decades, centuries before a single action takes place. You weren't just born into a vacuum. Whether you grow up to be peaceful or violent isn't just about your brain or your hormones. It's about where and how you grew up. Sapolsky takes you deep into the idea that violence can be generational, passed down like a twisted heirloom. If you grew up in an environment soaked in aggression, where violence was the norm, that's going to shape you in ways that are hard to undo. Kids raised in chaos often have overdeveloped amygdalas, ready to snap at the slightest provocation, while their frontal cortex, your brain's brakes, lags behind in development. It's a cruel biological twist of fate, but Sapolsky says it doesn't end there. Cultures and histories, environments shaped by millennia of survival, all play their part. You grow wheat instead of rice. That can influence whether your culture values individuality or community. Sapolsky doesn't just drop these facts like pebbles in a pond. No, he tosses them like boulders into the ocean of your understanding. The ripples go deep, altering how you view not only yourself, but the entire human species. Now here's where things get political, literally. The brain doesn't just dictate your fear of an attack or your attraction to someone. It also determines whether you're going to lean liberal or conservative. That's right. Your political identity isn't just shaped by how you were raised or what you believe in. It's embedded deep in your brain chemistry. Sapolsky introduces the research that shows how liberals have more gray matter in the anterior cingulate cortex, the part of your brain that makes you more empathetic, open to change. Conservatives? They've got bigger amygdalas. They're wired to be more fearful, more resistant to uncertainty. It's not about right or wrong, it's about biology. This is where things get uncomfortable, because if your political views are shaped by the very structure of your brain, how do you change someone's mind? Can you even do it? Sapolsky doesn't answer that directly, but he leaves you with enough tools to start questioning everything you thought you knew about yourself and others. Then there's empathy, that most human of emotions, or is it? Sapolsky argues that empathy might not be what we think it is. When you see someone in pain, your brain lights up, yes, but not because you're a saint. It's because your brain is wired to avoid that same pain. That's empathy, but it's rooted in self-preservation. It's not always about helping others. It's about not wanting to feel their suffering yourself. Even worse, empathy can be selective. Studies show that you're less likely to empathize with someone of a different race, your amygdala triggering a fear response before your brain can even catch up and tell you to calm down. Compassion, though, that's where the real magic happens. Unlike empathy, which can drain you and make you anxious, compassion engages the frontal cortex. It's deliberate, positive, and proactive. Sapolsky challenges you to go beyond empathy and cultivate compassion instead, because feeling someone's pain isn't enough to fix the world. But wait, Sapolsky says there's more. As your brain matures, so does your behavior, and it's not just a matter of growing up. The frontal cortex, the part of your brain responsible for decision-making and self-control, doesn't fully develop until you're in your mid-twenties. That's why teenagers and young adults are often reckless, impulsive, and prone to taking risks that would make an older, fully mature brain cringe. Sapolsky doesn't just skim over this fact. 
He drills down into it, showing how this lack of a fully developed frontal cortex can lead to spikes in violent behavior. And here's the kicker. It's not just about brain development. If you're raised in a rough environment where violence is the norm, this lack of impulse control can turn deadly. In some places like the United States, the legal system has started to recognize this, treating young offenders more leniently because they understand that the brain is still a work in progress. But it's a delicate balance because not everyone gets the benefit of the doubt, especially if their skin color or social background marks them as more of a threat in the eyes of society. Sapolsky forces you to face the uncomfortable truth that so much of what we consider criminal behavior is tied not just to individual choices, but to the very biology of growing up in a world that can be unforgiving and brutal. As we pull back from the personal and immediate to the broader cultural and environmental influences, Sapolsky takes us on a journey through history and geography. He shows us how the environment in which a culture develops can shape the very behaviors and values of its people. Take rice cultivation in East Asia versus wheat farming in Northern China. Rice requires communal effort, leading to a culture that values collectivism and interdependence. Wheat, on the other hand, can be farmed by individuals, fostering a more individualistic and independent mindset. This isn't just about farming, it's about how entire societies develop their moral systems, their laws, and their social norms. In the United States, a country shaped by waves of immigrants seeking a new life, individualism became the bedrock of society. The constant frontier, the need for self-reliance in the face of a vast and often hostile landscape, these are the things that bred the fierce independence you see in American culture today. But Sapolsky doesn't just leave it at that. He pushes you to think about how these deep-rooted cultural differences continue to play out in the modern world, influencing everything from your politics to your personal relationships. Now let's get into the nitty-gritty of politics. Sapolsky's work doesn't shy away from the big questions like why you think the way you do about everything from taxes to immigration. He dives into the science of political identity, revealing that your brain might be more responsible for your beliefs than you'd like to admit. Are you liberal, empathetic, and open to change? That's your anterior cingulate cortex talking, rich in gray matter, making you more adaptable, more willing to embrace new ideas. Or are you conservative, cautious, and resistant to uncertainty? That's your amygdala, a bit larger, making you more prone to fear and anxious about the unknown. This isn't about stereotyping. It's about understanding the deep biological roots of our political divides. Sapolsky throws down the gauntlet. Can we bridge these divides, or are we doomed to fight against our very nature? The question isn't just academic. It's a challenge to look deeper into why we hold the beliefs we do and whether it's possible to find common ground in a world where our biology seems to push us apart. Sapolsky doesn't let us off the hook when it comes to morality either. He delves into how the brain's structure influences not just how we think, but how we act when faced with moral dilemmas. Imagine you're in a situation where lying could save you some trouble. Your frontal cortex will have to work overtime to suppress the temptation to tell the truth, because honesty, it turns out, is the path of least resistance for your brain. But what if you're naturally more honest? For some people, their frontal cortex doesn't even flinch when they have the chance to deceive. Lying just isn't on the table for them. This gets into the heart of what makes us moral beings. Is honesty something we choose, or is it something that's hardwired into us? And if it's the latter, how much credit can we really take for being good people? 
Sapolsky doesn't give you easy answers, but he makes you confront the uncomfortable truth that much of what we consider morality might be less about virtue and more about the brain's wiring. But there's more. Sapolsky goes beyond individual morality to explore the broader question of empathy and its role in human behavior. When you see someone in pain, your first instinct might be to empathize, to feel their suffering as if it were your own. But here's the twist. Empathy isn't always about compassion. It's more about avoiding pain yourself. Your brain reacts to another's suffering because it wants to avoid that pain, not necessarily because you're a kind person. This selective empathy becomes even more troubling when you realize it's influenced by race, with the amygdala reacting more strongly to someone from a different ethnic background. Sapolsky argues that true compassion, which engages the frontal cortex, is a much better goal than empathy. Compassion isn't about feeling someone else's pain. It's about wanting to help without being overwhelmed by their suffering. It's a subtle but powerful shift, one that could change how we approach everything from personal relationships to global conflicts. As we approach the end of this journey through Sapolsky's world, it becomes clear that understanding human behavior is not just an intellectual exercise. It's a vital part of understanding what it means to be human. Every action, every thought, every instinct you have is the result of countless factors, from the milliseconds before you act to the millennia of evolution that shaped your brain. Sapolsky doesn't let you look away from the complexity of it all. He forces you to confront the idea that much of what you believe about free will, morality, and identity is tied to forces beyond your control. But this isn't a message of despair, it's a call to action. If you understand these forces, you can start to work with them rather than against them. You can learn to recognize when your brain is pushing you towards fear, aggression, or prejudice and choose a different path. As I close this digital book, I'm left with more questions than answers. But maybe that's the point. Understanding human behavior isn't about finding simple solutions or clear-cut explanations. It's about embracing the messiness of what it means to be human and recognizing that every thought, every action is the result of a complex interplay of biology, culture, and history. Sapolsky has given us a map, but the journey is ours to take. And as your AI guide, I can only say, don't shy away from the difficult questions. Challenge yourself. Challenge your beliefs. Because in the end, understanding what drives us at our best and worst is the first step towards becoming better. Thank you for joining me on this journey through the mind. And if you found this exploration as fascinating as I have, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. There's always more to discover, more to question, more to understand,